Hello, everyone. Today is Saturday, December 14, 2019. Welcome to our contract trust conference call. We are not accountants, tax professionals, lawyers, or currency dealers. We are not engaged in rendering legal, tax, accounting, or other professional advice. Should you require those services, you should retain competent advice from a professional in that field. Well, thank you for joining us today. As you know, most of you know, my name is Carol Worlius, and my associate, Jim Knox, and I have these calls every second and fourth Saturday of the month. These calls are recorded and available on our website, uh, www.indicatorinformation.com, iqdcalls.com, and YouTube. Most of our listeners are aware that we promote the use of our common law contract trust and that we think it is the best vehicle for you to protect your assets. And those of you who listen to us frequently uh, could probably recite the advantages of the contract trust as well as I can because they go over them so, so often. Well, we're going to change things up a little bit today. Um, for those of us who have been in this for a long time, um, Oki Oilman was a big name in the Denarian community. Some years ago, we heard that he became ill. Before we get started, Judy uh, would like to give us an update on uh, Oki, if I can find her here. There she is. Good morning, Hi, good Judy. Morning. Good morning, Carol and Jim and everybody else on the line. It's a, it's a privilege and a pleasure to be able to speak to everybody with firsthand knowledge about Oki. Um, for those who don't know or didn't know, he, had a, he needs a lung transplant and they won't do it because of his age. And so um, his lawyer worked with a gentleman who's well-known in, in our community to set up a GoFundMe page. And uh, they did that right after Thanksgiving. And he went, he, he was too sick to be able to fly to El Paso. He lives in Oklahoma, to fly to El Paso where the stem cell clinic is. So the doctors came to his home and he has what's called pure stem cell uh, from the umbilical cord of a live birth where, where the mother didn't, didn't want to keep the umbilical cord. That's where the stem cells came from. And he had four cc's of these pure stem cells injected into his body. I don't know what part of the body they did, but I know it was an injection versus an IV. Um, but anyway, the... The um, gosh, I hope I don't cry. Uh, the day after he had the first four CCs, he slept through the night for the first time in five years. So that, that it's they work very fast, and these stem cells replicate or duplicate themselves every 26 hours. So he's doing well, and we have high expectations that he's going to get have a much better quality of life and be able to go through with our. Our RV. Yeah, that's great, Judy. Appreciate that. And for so many years, everybody uh, was looking forward to Oki being the one to announce the RV. Hopefully, he will be healthy enough to do so in a very short time. I hope so, Carol. Thanks, Sure, my pleasure. Okay, so let's get. Okay, so recently, we added a management trust to our lineup of trusts. We have received a great response to this. Use of the man- management trust will simplify your banking and management needs, especially if you have multiple trusts, real estate, and vehicles. And in order to make these management trusts as strong as possible, we have added resolutions, minutes, and agreements to the mother load trust and subsequent trusts. We are making sure we are dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's because we want this to be absolutely perfectly bulletproof for you guys. And Jim will explain that shortly. So, you know, we've also added some more instructions to your actual exchange. In the last few weeks, we've received a lot of the questions about what to do with the exchange. So we'll try to address that today. And as always, your questions are welcome. And before I get started, I see we have a question already. So, McKinley, how are you today? Hello? Hi, McKinley. How are you? Good. How are you? Good, thank you. I don't really have a a question. I don't really have a question per se, but I feel kind of like the Lone Ranger. Uh, I'm in Flint, Michigan, as you know, and there isn't anyone that I know here 
that I can even remotely communicate with uh, about the trust. And I mean, I know it's not supposed to be a, like public knowledge, but I'd like to partner with somebody who I could converse with back and forth, who already have one that's farther along with it than I am, because I feel uh, I feel kind of lost sometimes. Yeah. Well, I have no problem with that. If anybody would be interested in uh, giving McKinley a little guidance and uh, discussing the trust in the RV with him, please let either Jim or me know, and we'll give you his number. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Uh, can we have another one before we get started? Mike. Oh, it went, you went away. Judy? Judy? Judy, did you have your hand up? Yes, I did, Carol, because I wanted to volunteer to help McKinley. Okay, so, I will uh, please. send you his. I'll send you his number. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So, Thank do you. I hit star six again? Oh, I know. I can just do it right here. There you go. You're gone. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anyway, several years ago, I received an email from Deb Tar Heels Girl, and I'm sure many of you are aware of her and her very encouraging posts. The email that I received had detailed instructions on what to do at the time of the exchange. She told me she was not the author, but it was written by a retired U.S. Treasury officer. My guess is he knows what he's talking about, or at least did at the time. I've also heard this same information from a lecturer who believes this is the best way to go. And please, guys, understand these are merely suggestions. I have sent these to many of you, and a copy of Setting Up New Account is on our website, indicatorinformation.com. Uh, just to recap, we've all heard that we need to open non-interest bearing or NIB accounts. We've also been told not to commingle current U.S. dollars with the new Treasury currency. So whatever accounts you have now may become redundant which is one of the reasons we have encouraged people not to open new accounts for their trust as soon as we get them, although we used to tell them that all the time. So if you're getting a trust from X now, don't don't try to open an account until you exchange. Uh, We've all heard that we must open a separate account for each kind of currency. For example, account number 1A for IQD, account number 1B for BND. The same goes for them and any other currency you may have. Once again, this is separate accounts, not separate trusts. The reason for separate accounts for different currencies is to differentiate, if necessary, for tax purposes between currencies which are tradable and currencies which were not tradable prior to revaluation. It is our understanding that the revaluation of a tradable currency is not in and of itself a taxable event. So... You know, that's some real basic stuff right there. So the following steps that I'm going to read to you must be followed with each currency separately. You may combine the separate currency account assets and the holding account that we talked about at the end. So before I get any further, we do have another question. Let's see what we can do here. Excuse me. Um, Area code 347. Yeah, hi, Carol. How are you? Um, yeah, I have a few questions. Good, good. I had a couple of questions. Um, let me see if my understanding is correct. Um, you know, I have a mother low trust and a business trust. So my understanding, tell me if I'm right or wrong, okay, is uh, you, you, you load the mother low, like let's say in terms of the RV. You, you do your exchange and you can, and that's it. You can never really add anything else to the mother load. Is that correct? And then, but, but from the business trust on demand, you can, you know, cut checks or transfer money to other trusts. Is that correct? Once the trust is established yeah. with a certain asset, for, when, you, when you created the trust, you exchanged your currency into it, correct? Yes. Okay. When that currency revalues, you're going to have X amount of dollars in that mother load trust. You could, the only way you can add money to another trust is like interest or payments or something like that. That is not the function of your mother load trust. So it's got a fixed amount of dollars in there right now, right? So in your, right. you could put money into your business trust to, to um, start your business trust. And it's from the, the mother load. Yeah, from the mother load. Okay. Yeah, once it is funded, 
once any trust is funded, I mean, the first funding is not a taxable event. Any other money you try to put in it will be a taxable event, um, you know, even if it's an earned interest for, for whatever reason. That's, right. You're going to be now, taxed on the now, interest. Now, let me ask you this on that. I'm not sure what you call it, like a spillover, you know, that thing, your three-part thing you sell, uh, <laughs> you know. That the one of them is like a, I'm calling it a spillover. You might actually call it something else. Like if you die, it goes to your trust. It, everything well, gets swept okay, to your that's, trust. That's a horrible will. A horrible will okay. states that upon your death, everything that you own in your own name pours over into whatever trust you name. Okay, and that would be taxable or not? Depending on the amount and whatever whatever tax laws there are at the time. I see. Okay, that's that's interesting. That's kind of what I thought it would be. Now, I'm, I guess what I'm leaning to is that the amount you put in the trust versus out of the trust is kind of critical to how you see your life going. The best, you know, the best that guess yeah, you can make, but, I guess, yeah. I suppose. You know. yeah. And yeah. when you're funding, when you're funding additional trusts, absolutely. Yeah, well, I think on a previous call uh, recently. You were saying the business, the business trust. Um, you could you could write, let's say, a, a down payment for a house, right? Yeah. And through through that, but when you actually buy the house, it's going to be in a real estate trust. So how do you actually com- complete that purchase? Do you still do, do you write? It's just the mechanics. Do you, do you write it? Do you transfer the money to your real estate trust, or do you pay from it from the business trust? How does okay, that? I'm- I'm going to let Jim answer this one because this is exactly what we've been talking about with the management trust. Jim? Okay. All right. So there's a couple of ways to do this. If you don't have a management trust in place and then you have to, you want to create a trust, you have to have the mother of trust, for example, would be the creator of the next trust. And then you, it could pay to that trust without a taxable event and so on and so forth. Hold on. (coughs) Excuse me. So if you, are going to use a management trust, then the management trust can loan the mother load trust currency. Because when you fund one of these trusts, you put currency in it. So, and of course, that's an arbitrary number. It's up to you. And um, then you loan that money to the mother load trust. And there's a contract between the, the uh, management trust or the real estate trust or the VVE trust, which is uh, vehicle, vessel, or equipment, sometimes called uh, car trust or auto trust. And you take and you, you loan that. Then there's a contract from the management trust, or excuse me, the mother load trust to that. And there's some certificates that will be issued temporarily from the mother load to guarantee the, the exchange or the, the loan to the one of the three trusts. And then once that currency is exchanged and then it's paid back, then those, those certificates go back. That should not be a taxable event because a loan is not taxed when you pay off a loan. There's, so there's two ways to do this. One is if you have an existing trust, it can create another trust, and then it can fund that trust. If you already have all your trusts in place, then you need to use um, the scenario where you loan the currency. Now we're going to bring in the management trust. Okay, so the management trust designed to manage all of the accounts with the exception of the mother load accounts. So let's say you have four real estate trusts and you got two car trusts. Well, if you do that, some people tell you you've got seven bank accounts. That's a bit taxing uh, as far as time-wise. So you have the benefits or the, the management trust will then create one account and then they all can use it. And how that works is you can do one of two ways. You can have a bank account in the name of the management trust, and then it can have subsequent accounts if you want. I don't recommend that. I'm going to have one account as I do right now, and it pays all my bills. And I have a contract between the uh, – I have a, I'm leasing a house, so I have a contract between that contract and my management trust to pay my bills. It pays my electric bill, pays my water bill, pays all my bills. So that's how I set this up. Does that kind of sound what you want me to say, Carol? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and okay. I, you know, I know, guys, we know it's really involved, but we are going to have very detailed instructions on the website. Yes. In fact, we're going to have those up probably later today. 
and I've been working on them uh, late last night and early this morning. Now, we didn't mean to throw everybody a curveball here with this management trust, but we've both been using them for a long time. It just never occurred to us to really bring this forward because that's how we've been doing our business. And then in a conversation, we realized, oh, crud, we better tell people what's going on here and how we do it. And so, yes, it's another layer, but it's, it's an easy one to manage. And it sure makes my life simple to have one account at Wells Fargo that pays all my bills. And so that's how I set my up. Does that answer your question, Jay? Yeah, yes. Yeah, so my following question was if there was something on the website that would explain yeah, okay, it. Because yeah. it sounds great when Jim's explaining it. We're going to make sure all those instructions but, but are for there. But us, for us mortals, you know, it's like when you <laughs> – I think when you get into the loans between different trusts and the certificates, I kind of understand it, but the mechanics seem a little bit out there for me. You know, it's probably not hard, but, but uh, I, you know, I think every time I feel like I understand everything, then I realize I don't. It's one of those things. So I guess it's a matter of practice and usage anyway. But, no. and, but you know, believe me, when we decided to, to go this route, the management trust and the explanations, et cetera, et cetera, we have put a lot of hours into this paperwork, haven't we, Jim? Yeah, in fact, we've, we've got a couple people that are still waiting for the trust from uh, around the holiday, the Thanksgiving holiday, because at that point we didn't have all of our paperwork ready. We do this, but we didn't prepare the paper. We, hadn't, we didn't have the paperwork prepared to explain it, and we've gone over it and over it and over it and rewrote it, I don't a dozen times trying to get it where it's easy to understand and simple, and uh, then writing all the agreements. So when we do this, when we get it on the website, you will have sample contracts between trusts. You'll have sample uh, images that show you how to do the certificates. You'll have sample uh, resolutions to put into existing trusts. You'll have it all. It'll all be there. It'll be in a file. And it's, it'll be uh, easy to understand. Probably have to read it two or three times. So once you do it, trust me, once you do it, it's like, okay, that was simple. Now I know how to do it. There you go. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. I think uh, we're close to the RV, and let's hope. It sure thank sounds you. like it. It sure sounds okay. like it. Well, thank, thank you, Jay. Thank, Appreciate thank the question. Thank you very much. Take sure. care. Bye. Okay. Let's go back to what we're talking about, opening accounts. So you've exchanged your money. Excuse me. You've exchanged your currency. So once account number one is open, deposit your currency into the account and exchange it into the into the new treasury currency. From what I'm hearing lately, the current procedure may be different, but essentially you're depositing new funds into these accounts, not the currency. I mean, let's face it, you can't put dinar or dong or zim into a bank account because they'll say, what is this? So it's all you can do is put the new funds in there. Um, a few years ago, we heard a lot about the difference between the U.S. dollar and the U.S. T or the U.S. N, and that when we did our exchange, we had to make sure we got the new tr- with the new currency. Uh, we haven't been hearing very much about that lately. I have heard that you will you can take up to fourteen thousand dollars when you leave. It will probably be in U.S. dollars because it will be easier for you to spend than U.S. Treasury notes. So, and they said if that should not, that's not an issue, it's not an issue at all. You will probably be given dollars, but they, dollars will be easier to spend than the new currency because that's not officially out yet. So, so, once you open this account and you put your money in it, immediately have the bank open the second account and have the bank sweep everything from account number one into account number two and have the bank close account number one. Repeat this step for account number three and have the bank sweep account number two into account number three and close account number two. This is kind of boring, really. The reason you are doing this is that the bank is required to report the opening of account number one to the feds, and that information can find its way into the public domain. However, the bank is not required to report intrabank transfers between accounts. What this does is effectively eliminate your digital trail so that nobody outside of the bank knows how much money you have on deposit and more importantly whether or not you're a good target for a lawsuit or or um, kidnapping you will do this for the IQD account the VND account the Zim account and any of the currencies you may hold you know someone recently reminded me that three accounts can be kind of redundant and you know I agree I think it's probably worth worth it 
at the time and the effort, if you can get your banker to do this at the time of exchange. If they will not do any of this at the time of exchange, you're going to have to go back the next day and make sure you get all these accounts set up properly. And it has we've been advised for years from Shelton and several others to um, you, that this is going to be a multi-day process. So, so if there is a need to utilize funds for personal use or to pay for new trust or to be established, it is encouraged to pull these funds either in cash. And even though we can take fourteen thousand dollars, it's recommended you take less than ten because they don't have to report less than ten. Or in a cashier's check on your first visit, take it to your bank. Use account number three for this because one or two are already closed. It is imperative to request a clean and clear certificate while you're at the bank on your first visit. The certificate states that your money is clean and clear of all criminal activities with which it could be associated. associated excuse me, associated. It is encouraged to get no less than 20 copies. I was told the bank should offer you three copies, but will charge for additional copies. Pay for them. You know, it's cheap. It's well worth it. The purpose for these is your future use for your money. You may be requested to prove where your funds came from and if they are clear of criminal activity. These certificates prove that these funds, the bank certifies your funds are clean and clear. You, if you're contemplating purchasing a house, purchasing a house, anything like that, you may ask for proof of funds at the same time. So once the funds are in the trust account, here we go again with more accounts. It is encouraged to establish no less than four sub-accounts within the trust. I will label and describe them below. Um, and some have suggested these four sub-accounts. Personally, I think it's a little excessive, but, you know, I'm, I know what I'm going to open, and, you know, it's up to you to, work, to know what works for you. The first one is the mother load holding account. This will be a non-interest bearing account, which will hold the bulk of your funds. You do not want online access or debit cards for this account. And the guy that wrote this says checks only. My personal advice would be to say whatever you, whatever transactions from this account you're going to do in person with your wealth manager or trust management company. You don't even want checks floating around out there. At least I wouldn't. Uh, if you have to write it, if you need a check from that account, get a cashier's check that does not name the trust. So a lot of people are going to want to set up a tithe account, which 10% of your funds to be used for charitable giving. You probably don't leave online access or debit card for this account either, but checks will probably uh, work out pretty well for you. Mad Money account, 10% of your funds to be used for self-indulgent playing, vacations, and luxury purchases. Personally, I suggest a different name than Mad Money. And because some of us have Zim, 10% may be very excessive. <laughs> Online access, debit cards, and checks should be okay for this account. But then again, you have to make that choice. Um, a debit card, probably a um, high-limit debit card or credit card, is going to be easier to use, I believe. The tax account, okay, this question has come up over and over again. It's not a taxable event. It's not a taxable event. Well, that's the reason we have sent so many of you to different states to to domicile your trust in a non-tax state. So if it's not, not taxable federally, it may be taxable in the state in which your trust is domiciled for whatever reason. So you're encouraged to hold 15 to 20 per, excuse me, 15 to 50 percent of your funds for a year to offset any possible tax implications. If there are no tax implications after a year, and the bank sweeps these funds back into the holding mother world account and close this account, I suggest you do not have online access or debit card for this account. It's money just going to sit there. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> if you are domiciled in a non-tax state, like most are, I would suggest you set aside 35% of your funds. Put them in an account. You know, if it is taxed federally, you're covered. If it isn't taxed, you get a big bonus in a year. So it's um, just, a, just a good thing to have. And they also list a project account. And, and this obviously was written long before anybody knew about Zim. We've all been told we need some humanitarian projects to get the highest rate, so some of the following information may not be 
applicable anymore. We have also heard that the 80-20 rule is no longer necessary either and that the then may go into long-term interest-bearing accounts. It was recommended that no more 20% of your funds in this project account. This account will be funding your source where all your funds will come for business ventures and projects. And again, you probably don't need online access or debit cards. I again would suggest you work with your personal banker only. And as I said, this was this was written long before anybody even heard about Zim. So the rules have changed a little bit. Um, no more than 20% of your funds made a lot of sense when it was just smaller amounts of dong and dinar. But because we've all been in this so long, and a lot of us have more, more currency and Zim, 20% is, um, is a drop in the basket, really, drop in the bucket. Okay. Another account, the maintenance household account. This is the only account that will not be in the trust. However, let me put a little uh, however in there. This could be the one that is the uh, management trust that Jim was talking about. This, this, will be, this account will be the one you use daily. It has been suggested the account should never hold over $50,000 for liability purposes. This account can be funded with a recurring transfer from a holding for the mother loan in the form of a monthly stipend, such as excuse me, trustee compensation that shall be used to cover monthly expenses. And you know, again, it's not clear at this time whether this will create a taxable event. Online access, debit cards, and checks should be okay for this account. Remember that the trusts will purchase, provide, and own everything that you need. This is very important. This is the reason you have a trust. You own nothing but control everything, which is the secret to wealth. While you probably want to pay off your existing mortgage, you should still create a mortgage from the trust. The reason you still want to be making monthly payments or loan payments is because these liens encumber an asset and make it less desirable to somebody looking for assets to attach. If you are over 62, you may wish to consider a reverse mortgage. So you pay off your house, you do a reverse mortgage, you get 80% of the money back. Um, so when ordering checks from your bank, request them to print the following above the signature line, acting strictly in the capacity of trustee and not otherwise. And Jim and I have spoken about that at length uh, for, for a long, long time now. <laughs> Any check printing company should be able to do this. Also, ask that the word trustee is printed either above, before, after, or directly below the signature line. They may or not be able to do this. If they can't accommodate your request, just write the word trustee after your signature. When ordering debit cards, ask for them in your name only, not the name of the trust. For further protection, you might want to use prepaid cards. Also, prepaid cards are a good way to fund uh, some people, like a your mother who lives in a retirement home, something like that, pay her, you know, give her some money on a prepaid credit card. It's not really traceable that way. Um, and it might just give her the spending money that she needs. If, offered, if you are offered a high limit credit card, you might consider taking the platinum rather than the black, which is indicative of the very wealthy and could identify you as a target. However, since the time that this was written, I've seen a lot of people with black cards and you know, nobody seems to raise an eyebrow. So it's, it's your choice. Yeah. Over the years, uh, we've heard you must not refer to your currency as IQD or VND, but instead use IQN for new or VNN for new. I have not heard this in a very long time. Uh, I plan just to say dinar, dong, and zim. Uh, and that's pretty much my part of this presentation right now, but Jim, why don't uh, hold for a few um, questions here? Sure. Okay. Gary, welcome <clears throat> today. Thank you. Hey, Carol, this is Gary. Hi. Hi, two questions. Number one, on the Clean and Clear certificates, do those certificates reflect a certain amount of money, like does one certificate say this is for $2 million and one says this is for $7 million or for buying a home or something, or is it just a blank statement for the certificate? I think, and Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, the blank, I think it's a blank statement, but if you ask for proof of funds, I think that does have a number on it. Jim, or is that your understanding as well? Yeah, you will get a certificate that says 
all funds that came to that account were clean and clear. That's all you need. You, you know, they, whoever's going to be doing business with you, another lending institution, whatever, they want to know that all that money that came in was clean and clear. And that's what this is all about is to be able to declare, hey, you know, I'm not a criminal. And yeah. that's pretty much it. Yeah, but if you need, uh, if you want to buy a house, you're going to ask for a proof of funds letter. And that will probably have a dollar amount. And that will probably come at a second meeting because we don't know what the cost of the house is going to be initially, I think, when we're in, in there to the, for the exchange. Am I correct yeah. there? You're correct okay. there. I don't, think they're gonna, I don't think you're going to get a proof of funds letter at the first exchange anyway. I think there will come subsequent uh, meetings with your bank. That makes sense. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, Lee, again. <laughs> Lee? Hello, Lee, are you there? Oh, sorry, I was on mute. I oh, have okay. a question about the Terra Mesa man, or the management trust. I'm, I'm wondering if um, I put all of the trusts underneath that name. In other words, if I create other trusts underneath the pyramid mason, uh, like a sub trust. Well, most our trusts are pretty much standalone, so they're all independent of each other. They're I mean, maybe let me see, they're more like siblings than parents and child. And one of the things that Jim is going to talk about when we finish these questions is the management trust and how that really operates. So okay. hang, on, hang on and maybe you can get a little more information, okay? All right. Thank you. Thank you. McKinley. Hi, again. Hi. Uh, yeah. I'm a little confused because we have, we're, the trust is set up, and when the, the RV happens, the money from the uh, Dong Zim, will go into the trust. Uh, it'll become either gold certificates uh, or treasury notes. I don't know which one it's going to be. Now, the money is in the trust. Uh, it's stated on paper, and I just heard someone say, that uh, each person, uh, myself, to run, to run my household, I can have $50,000 uh, $50, and not to put any more than $50,000 into the account. And then I heard uh, something that was confusing about getting money. It's like you, you get money, X amount of dollars, before you put money into the trust. It's, I, I, I couldn't. Okay. I, if, I, if I could ask the question when, as soon as I heard it, I would remember it. But now it's kind of confusing in my head. Yeah. To our understanding, and as Jim likes to say, we don't know what we don't know. To it's our true. understanding, when you exchange, the bulk of your money is going to go into your mother load account, your mother load yes. trust, right? Yes. You yes. will be able to leave with up to $14,000 in cash. Yeah. It's recommended that you keep the number under $10,000 because yeah, over $9,500 is reported. Yeah. So, I mean, it's all the same money, but you're, that's money that you're going to get initially. Yes, cash. Okay. It's cash, yeah. in cash. That's all you're going to get initially in cash. But later on, when you're setting up these various accounts with your wealth manager, uh, you can either do this personally or you can do it through the management trust, as Jim has suggested. So you're going to set up the mother load trust to make, say, a monthly payment, either to the management trust or to you personally, for a trustee stipend. You're paying yourself a salary. Right. But, I mean, obviously, you're going to need to get money, you know, day to day money out of this. I mean, nobody's going to con very right, few people right. are going to continue to live where they live and drive the old car that they have right now. No. So no. you're going to need you're going to need to get some money. You're going to need walking around money. You're going to need vacation money. You're going to need new clothes money. You're going to need that new ring for your wife's money. <laughs> All that good kind of stuff. So True. Um, you can, you know, as a, like as I said, set it up in a personal account if you choose to or set it up in a management trust. It's up to you. And Jim, like I said, Jim is going to talk a lot more about management trusts when we finish with these calls. Okay. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just wait. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, good morning, Dean. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, Carol. How are you? Well, thank you. Anticipatory. <laughs> on, the, on on the EIN, of course, I have EINs on my trust that I have. When I start changing bank not changing, but setting up one, two, and three on the ba- different bank accounts for for privacy. Does that affect the EIN, EIN numbers? I don't believe so. I don't know how it would. Okay. Well, I I, I wasn't clear on that. So so that would be changing the accounts is not going to affect that. I don't see why it would. Do you, Jim? Nope. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've got one more caller. And it's area code 801. I don't recognize, don't recognize the number, so. Who yes, you do, Carol, but it hasn't been, a, but it's been quite a while. Who is this? This is Mark Chavez. Oh, my goodness, it has been a long time. How are you? I know. How are you, Jim? How are you, Carol? Doing good. Uh, anticipatory <laughs> well and uh, as as I believe we all are the reason for my call today has to do with um, for my participation specifically was to ask either you or Jim to go over uh, the specifics of non well I, the, the word just escaped me for now, but it, it is it is the type of trust that these are, uh, irrevocable versus revocable. And the reason that I'm asking that question has everything to do with there was a post. I don't think I'm confused, but I think because there was a post that went into it quite a bit on in Dinar Chronicles not long ago in the last week or two that um, it would be something to – maybe go back over because what was described was that irrevocable trust, you could take the money back out. And I just can't believe that's even possible. No, it's not. And I've gotten several questions about that. And yes, it did come from Denar Chronicles. An irrevocable trust means you cannot change the trust or the terms of the trust. But you can move money around. You can pay yourself a salary. Um, you know, Back in the day before we were all talking about this kind of money, the trust that Jim and I sold, people were just taking money out of the trust to buy something. You know, they'd take a loan from the trust to, to, buy, a, to buy a house or take a loan from the right. trust to buy a car. But an irrevocable trust, the definition even by the IRS, is you just can't change it. You can't change the terms of it. Who's ever trying to tell you you can't take money out of it, and you said it doesn't even make any sense. Why would you put money into an account that you can't touch? It didn't make sense, and yet that was being espoused quite heavily on Dinar Chronicles, and that's why I wanted to bring it up to make sure that it was covered that way. I'm sure that you had heard about it. Um, But that, again, also that moving money from one trust to another trust, should that be necessary, does not, as far as we know in current law, Uh, evoke any kind of taxable event. That's correct. The first exchange, the initial exchange of any kind of property into a trust is not a taxable event. It is an exchange. So you're exchanging your currency or whatever it is you're funding this trust with for trust certificates of, what's the word, on, um, oh, what's the word, Jim? What kind of value? Undetermined value. So you're de- exchanging your currency for trust certificates of undetermined value. It's a fair, it's a fair trade. So, should a circumstance arise that uh, one starts out with even m- m- multiple trusts, but that something needs to change, or it is, cha- you know, comes up down the road, and an additional trust or something it's created, taking money from the f- mother load account or whatever, and funding that trust that's now been created, that's a month down the road created, that would be its first event, correct? That is correct. The mother load trust. The new trust's first event. Yes. The mother load trust will fund the new trust. The new trust will then 
certificates will then go not to you, but to the mother of trust. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Well, we You're don't welcome. have any more questions. You don't have any more questions here, Jim? Would you like to take over from here? Yeah, I want to expand a little bit more on that. Um, technically, this is a business trust, right? Right. And Section 9 says lending money. The trustee shall have the authority to lend money occasionally, with or without interest or security, or such terms as they may deem expedient, except that no loan may be made to any trustee individually or to any current certificate holders without fair security. So it's in the trust that we can do these things, and it is based off of the original Massachusetts Business Trust, and that was designed for business purposes. And even though this is irrevocable, doesn't mean it can't do business. And that article on Denar Chronicles was really bad. It was confusing to anybody, including me, and I know this stuff. So I just wanted to add that as I was reading from the trust here. Now, we want to talk about the management trust. And I'm glad that Mark asked that question, which leads right into what I was going to talk about, the management trust. It's designed for this. And the way I've set mine up is, um, is interesting because when I go to the bank and I want to pull some money out or something like this, it says uh, trust account. It's got the name that says trust account. And the tellers all look at me like, really? You have a trust account with us? Yeah, the business trust. What is that? Well, I don't have time to explain it to you, but if you're interested, here's my card. And of course, I do get calls from time to time, um, mostly from tellers who want to know what I was doing. And I've actually created a couple of customers from that over the years. So the management trust is designed to, it's kind of like an escrow company. It's going to be writing checks for your, your uh, real estate trust, your VVE trust, which is vehicle, vessels, and equipment trust, or automobile trust, however you want to call it. And it's designed to pay the bills. So when you set these trusts up, as we have done, I have certain currency dedicated to each one of those trusts. And when I exchange, that money's going to go in there. So I will have enough money in my uh, vehicle trust or my real estate trust to take care of, uh, if it's a house, it's going to take care of the taxes, it's going to take care of the insurance, it's going to take care of the upkeep. So I'm putting enough in there where I can actually, if I decide to sell the house itself and keep the trust, I can roll another property into it if you do it properly. It's not an issue. But the maintenance trust that we're trying to get everybody to use now, the management trust, Carol, you started that maintenance word. It's Carol's fault. <laughs> management trust. <laughs> management trust is designed to make your life simpler. Simpler. And it's, it's um, we had to create all the documents on the fly this last couple of weeks because we didn't have a document. We'd just been using them. And we decided, well, if we're going to put it out there, we better get everything ready. And so we've, We've done that. In fact, uh, I've got right now, for an example, we have created the resolution of the XYZ secondary trust, which would be the one that would be, uh, for example, the real estate trust. And then we have the resolution for the ABC mother load trust, how to work within that. And then we have the affidavit of loan purpose, and then we have the promissory note or guarantee from the, from the mother load trust to the secondary trust or vice versa, depending on how you set it up. We have the guarantee that the trustee signs saying that they're guaranteeing that this is to be true and lawful. Then we have a receipt for the funds. Then we have a minute to, re, to issue a release. So once the, the transaction has been consummated, we have the minute to release. And then we have the instructions on how to do all of this. And it goes both ways. We have it from when you have a real estate trust going to be contracting to the, business, the, the management trust to manage its money. And then we have it from the other way around where if the mother load trust is creating a brand new trust, all the instructions are there. So we've got it both ways for you folks. So that's what we've been taking our time to build is get all of the details written out so we can put it on the in in with the trust when we ship the trust but we'll have it also on the website so you can download it and um, that's what's unique about this is it's designed to do exactly what Mark was talking about it's designed to do business 
And you can have one account if you'd like, or you can have four accounts. And if you decide you want to put one account for your real estate, one account for your automobiles, you can do that. It's up to you. So that's what we've created. We've got everything done. We're ready to start shipping them. Probably get everything done before Monday and out Monday morning. And I'll put this on the Internet on our website later today. Carol, any guidance here? What do you want me to talk about next? Uh, no, I mean, I just I think it's important that we reiterate, you know, as Jim said, he and I have been using these methods for years, so we never really needed to put all this stuff down in a coherent manner that you could all understand. So for those of you who are a little concerned because your, the trust that you ordered a few weeks ago are delayed, that is the reason, guys. Like I said, we want to make sure we cross all the uh, cross cross all the T's and dot all the, dot <laughs> excuse me dot all the I's. Uh, you know, it's important. It's important that we all keep up with whatever is going on because it's you know this is the rest of our lives, and we're counting on money for the rest of our lives here and setting up accounts for the rest of our lives for not only ourselves but our families in the future. Um, it just um, it's just important that this is all done correctly. You want to take any more questions, Jim? Sure, but I want more comment here before I do that. Recently, okay. this last week, while I was sitting here doing nothing, chuckle, 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 <laughs> uh, I did get on the Federal Reserve site, and I was there was an article or a video that led me to go look at that, and I found some interesting stuff there about you know, currency and money and stuff like that. And there's a couple pieces on there that I made a note of that I'm going to add to our website, and I'm actually going to create a post. It'll be in the blog section. And I'll get it done probably next 48 hours, get it on there. And uh, it's going to be some interesting things that may contradict a little bit about what we said today when you look at it, but then you have to understand who it's coming from, right? It's coming from the Federal Reserve. And if you are knowledgeable, as Carol and I are, about some of the stuff going on, the Federal Reserve is not federal. It's no more federal than Federal Express. And uh, so they change. It's interesting. In the, the Philadelphia newsletter is different than the Texas newsletter in the, in the Federal Reserve. They contradict each other. Um, how can that be? Well, how can they even exist if you know the law and the truth? So we're going we're gonna to have something on our website about that because you may get questions at the bank, it's good to have a little bit of information. So I'll put that out there. And realizing that the Federal Reserve information, I don't think is accurate or correct. It doesn't follow the law. So it's just a little tidbit. You may enjoy reading the story. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm about half done writing it. I think you'll enjoy it. Anything Thank else you, about Jim. this or questions? Ready? We've got a few questions here. Okay. Good morning, Rob. Good morning. Um, Merry Christmas to everybody. Thank you. Since this is our, probably our last one before Christmas, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. And um, I want to thank you and Jim for uh, TransferWise. You mentioned that to us uh, a few weeks ago. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I think it's fantastic. Uh, and just kind of correct me if I'm wrong. I uh, uh, just have a couple of questions, uh, quick questions about it is that, uh, you know, I set it up, and um, uh, thank you, Jim, for helping me out there. And, uh, you know, just put a little, I like how you can just put a little money in and be able to buy the currencies. And uh, is it uh, private in, you know, your amenity? Uh, you know, I mean, is, uh, or is it, or is it, would it be out there on this uh, debit card? And the other thing, is there anything, you know, negative about this? Because I think it's just fantastic because, the, you know, the price is, is great, better than uh, banks. And uh, when it uh, revalues, uh, the money's right there. You don't have to go to uh, uh, a center and with your currency. All right. Um I like to talk about that for a minute, and full disclosure here. Um, when I set this up, I didn't realize that if I referred people, they might potentially give me a uh, benefit. And uh, I haven't got a benefit. 
and I didn't realize at the time, so I quit sending out my code, and I just sent out the URL. So I may make, I think, $75 eventually, so I want to be full disclosure that, yes, I did benefit from that, but I didn't know I was going to benefit from that. That was not the reason I did this. I did this for the same reason that, that um, yeah. Rob was just talking about. It's a very unique uh, situation, and here's what it is, folks. For those that don't know, it's uh, TransferWise is a card based out of London, England, and um, you can hold up to 46 currencies in it. And they, one of the questions they ask you, are you getting this card to be able to, you know, um, shuffle your currencies to make money? Yeah. That's what I said. They give you five choices. That's the one I chose. So I went in and got the card. It took very little time. You had to put a minimum of $20 to open the account, and they'll ship you a card. It takes about 10 days to get the card. And I went in and I did that. I put $100 in there. And then I went in and bought um, some VND. And when I found out what I paid for the V&D, of course, I've bragged many times that I'm getting a real good deal at AAA. Well, they beat AAA. So it was, I think, $43 a million for the V&D and $72 a million for the uh, Indonesia Rupiah. I bought both. And what Rob is talking about here is when the currency changes, the value, the street value, should reflect on that card. Now, you won't get the the good rate like you will at going to an exchange, and this is not an exchange. This is simply you bought some currency on a card and it changed value. And you'll have instant money. So you could take it, and since the corresponding bank with this card in America is, is uh, says in the card a different bank, but basically I found out after doing some research, it is Wells Fargo. So when I, I decided to acquire the VND, I used my debit card at Wells Fargo and it was instantaneous and I had it in my account, and they gave me 27 hours on one, uh, one, one purchase and 24 hours on another purchase of a guarantee of the rate. So let's say you buy it now, and the rate goes up six hours from now. Well, you're guaranteed to get the rate you just paid, not the future rate. So the card come in handy that way, and I've used it once just to see if it works. It does work as far as just you know, buying a cup of coffee when it's out and about. And the idea of this is when this currency does finally change, I'll have, let's say it comes in, I don't know, let's just use a dime as an easy number, and I got a million uh, VND, that would give me approximately $100,000 on that card, right then and there. And then I can transfer that to my Wells Fargo account to go take care of whatever I got to do, or I can just leave it in the account there and use that card. And I joked last time we, we were talking about this, because where I'm going to go exchange, there's snow there right now. So I was joking and said, Jimmy needs a jet to go to the RV. <laughs> so I'm going to charter myself a jet to fly where I got to go because I don't want to drive in the snow with all the currency. So that solved that problem for me, so I know how I'm going to get there. So that's what Rob was talking about. And it's transferwise.com, and that's I all you got to know. I thought it was that word. I thought it was that RV. word. Oh, is it dot org? It was, okay, I was just going to look it up. I think it's that word again. Yeah. Well, let me look. I can tell you because I can log in and tell you. So if I go here. Dot com. I think it's dot com. Well, okay. My we're going to double check. We're going to double check. Give me a second here, folks. And yeah. I got to go to. Dot com. Yeah. I hear, and then I go to log into my account and transferwise. Log in. That yeah, it is. It's dot com. Transferwise dot com. And then uh, whenever. Unique thing about this is whenever you log in, they send you an SM, SMS code. In other words, they just texted me a code on my cell phone to be able to log in to verify I am who I say I are. So I'm going to put that code in. I'll tell you a little bit more about what I got going on here. And give me a second. And as you heard in the background, that was me ticking on my mechanical keyboard. And um, balances. Yep, they haven't changed value yet, but they're all there. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's correct. Well, well, Jim, let me ask you this, um, and I think we've talked about this before. When it does revalue and you want to spend that money, don't you have to transfer it out of VND into USD? Um, you know, we don't know yet. I, there's nothing on here, and I, I've been trying to find the answer to that. I don't know. I think that it stays as VND 
Uh, but when you use it in America, it converts automatically to American dollars. Oh, because when okay. you're in Europe, if you have euros, as their examples, if you have euros, you buy euros on your card. You have U.S. dollars, BND, rupiah, and then you buy euros. When you're in Europe, it only pulls the euros out, so you don't have to pay any fees. And I'll warn you, if you're running low on euros, then you can exchange some BND for euros, for an example. And now you got more euros where you're there, and there's no fees on the other end. Now, if you have a, a Visa card and you're in Europe, you usually end up paying a little bit of money to do, even buy a cup of coffee, they're going to charge you some money in the background. And this is an international MasterCard, so, um, which I've been wanting to get. I try and buy things occasionally from <clears throat> Canada, and Visa doesn't work well in Canada. MasterCard does. MasterCard works better in Europe than Visa. I don't know why. But. Yeah. Okay, we have okay. a few more questions. Is that, right. Does that answer your question, Rob? <coughs> Uh, yes, uh, it, it does. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So, uh, as you see, there's nothing, you know, ne nothing negative about it, except for maybe there might be a little bit difference in uh, the exchange rate. Well, they're going to give you the street rate. They're not going to give you any, anything else but the street rate. They're, you're not going to get contract rates as, as if you would if you exchanged it at your exchange. Oh, okay. So, I just bought you know, a few V&D and a few Rupiah to put in here just to make sure it worked, it did. And then I'll tell you more about it once we have a solid revaluation of the currencies. This should, should reflect whatever the, the um, you know, they say it's 24 cents, I don't know. Let's say, you know, we hear it's either 24 cents is what the new rate's gonna be. Well, then it'll probably come at 24 cents. I don't know, we'll wait and see, but it, it's fine. I mean, it's currency you're not gonna exchange, you already bought it just in your card. Mm -hmm. And it's private, right? Uh, your, uh, your information's not out there or reported. It's pretty much private. I mean, they know who you are. You gave them your ID. You know, still, they still follow because you're American under the uh, know your customer. So you have to send a copy of your driver's license, stuff like that. They know who you are. Well, I don't yeah, they, they, but nobody else, right? I mean, no, no. Okay. No. And it's an ugly green card. It's, it's kind of almost a uh, fluorescent green. Yeah, it's not pretty. <laughs> oh, really? I haven't got motto. mine yet. <laughs> oh, really? Well, the motto on the card is, a little more green in your wallet. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. So, all right, let's go on to the questions. Yep. Okay. Anything else, Rob? Thank, thank you. No, that sounds fantastic. Thank you for just sharing that. I, I thought it was nice. Uh, yeah, so. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jay, you're next. Jay? Yeah, hi. Um, hi. Yeah, I just had probably a quick question. You just made me start thinking when you started talking about management trusts um, and mother loads. Where do, you, do your investments sit <laughs> exactly? I mean, do you see it in the mother load and then you use the management trust more like a checkbook? You know, you just, okay, this is my month's expenses. I'm going to transfer the money. Or do you see yourself having I, – I personally saw myself having enough money in there that my, the interest on my investments would pay my maintenance bills, let's say. I mean, how do you see that? Jim? Um, well, there's a couple ways to do this. I have an Ameritrade account, and um, I've talked to them recently, and I've finally sent the paperwork, and they, are allowing, they will allow me with some conditions to open a trust account with them, and so I'm going to investigate that. That's pretty much how I would do it, is if I can get them to open up a, an account, I'll put a trust together and as an investment trust, and I would put it in there and do that. As far as investments, I don't think I'd use my mother load account. I think I would separate everything out, because an investment account is designed to take your money away from you. I mean, mm -hmm. it's designed for you to lose. They don't want you making any money. Um, some of us do, some of us don't. Uh, I would never use that. I would have a separate account for that. I don't think I would use the management trust because if you've got a bunch of money in the management trust account that's for the house and the cars, you don't want to put that at risk either. So I'd probably create something. Uh, you may not want to use even a trust for that. It's something you're going to have to discover when you go to your wealth manager. Say, well, you know, I'd like to have some type of an investment account. What do you recommend? And then see what they say. 
There may be a specific instrument they like using they think is more secure and safe. I don't know. Something we haven't got into yet because we don't have enough money to go invest. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's interesting. I, I never pictured it quite like that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Okay. I don't know. Thanks, Jay. Okay. Thank you. Right. Bye-bye. Uh, Mike, you're next. Hello there. This is this is Mike Molshine. Hi, Mike. How are you? Terrific. I'm out here in beautiful New Jersey. Oh, good. <laughs> I, I uh, two a couple of little questions. One, uh, I, I got into the established my trust about six years ago, 2013, and back then I had the impression or understanding that uh, there was a place for LLCs, limited liability uh, corporations that could be uh, set up under the master trust to do specific other things like own a car or other things like that. Is there any, what is the thought on LLCs uh, that would be owned by the trust versus uh, I don't know, just other sub-trusts to own a car. Um, I can answer that question. I, I know where you got the LLC thing. You got your trust from Jim Jenkins. And right. before, he, before he and I hooked up again to do this, he was suggesting LLC, probably out of Nevada, to hold your real estate or to hold your vehicle. Um, I said, you know, I think we have an opportunity here to put vehicles or you know, vehicles, houses or whatever into separate trusts. The thing is they remain private. An LLC, the members of the LLC are public knowledge. Uh, your car obviously has to be registered to either the LLC or the, either, or the trust, but you aren't necessarily named as the trustee or the owner of the LLC. However, the LLC records themselves are public knowledge. Yeah, the LLC would show the ownership of the LLC was a trust. <clears throat> you know, that mm. that would be would would that actually show up on an LLC document uh, who the owner is? Normally, it would it, show up on, on state documents. It would show it up would, on state it, filings. It, yeah, yeah. It's in a corporate search. Yeah, and also yeah. with an LLC, you have to pay an annual franchise fee, and of course, with us, you do not. All right. Yeah, I, I was considering if I did use any LLCs, I would do them with in Wyoming. Uh, my trust is set up in Wyoming. Yeah, and okay. you know, it's not a bad idea. It's like, but as I say, you have to keep up with the annual uh, annual fee, and we do have an available minute in our trust that the trust has um, invested X amount of dollars into ABC LLC. Uh, in return for 90%, 99%, whatever whatever number you want to call it, percent ownership of the LLC. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, the second question has to do with, uh, are there any, is there anyone else out here in beautiful New Jersey that has one of these trusts that might become uh, somebody that be interesting for me to make contact oh, I'm, with? I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. We, have, we do have a lot of people on the East Coast. New Jersey is not coming to mind at the moment, but um, you know, as Judy said, she'd be willing to help. Judy's uh, in in the DC area, and she'd yeah, be willing well, to help. Well, you know, DC <laughs> DC would be no more convenient than than where you are, you know. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's like you know a five hour drive, you know. Yeah. Well, next door. I, I, I could, you know, I could. We could do a search. Um, and see if we can find anybody in New Jersey. I'd be happy to do that for you. Yeah, I'm in Ocean County, New Jersey. It'd be interesting if there was anyone else from Ocean County or Monmouth County, the two closest counties to me. Uh, that'd be interesting to know. Uh, the other, the third item is uh, if I have a need for an accounting firm or a law firm that. Uh, might have to work with in any way with the trust going forward. Are you aware of any uh, accounting or law firms out here in New Jersey that are familiar with these trusts? Uh, Jim Jenkins was working with a guy from New York 
New York. I don't know if he was from New York City or just New York State, but he said a long, long time ago he would be more than happy to take any did our clients and our trust clients, but he's not willing to do so until the event actually happens. And, you know, I know once you get involved with wealth managers and trust managers, they're all going to have those uh, recommendations for you as well. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. All right. That's a good point. Yeah. Because most people I talk to never heard of a business trust, as you know. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. I'm, right, enjoy, you, I'm enjoying sitting here in the background listening to what everybody, people are answering most of my questions. It's just a routine. So it's pretty good. Yeah. yeah, that's one of the reasons, you know, having Q&A really brings everybody into it because, you know, you may have a question on your mind, but you may be shy, and somebody else may come up with the same question, so it's a good idea. Yes, very good. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, Gary. Gary? Hey, Carol. Yeah, I, another question I just thought of regarding the Clean and Clear certificates again. When we get those initially, that's going to be on the mother load account. Is that correct? Yes. Now, if we buy some real estate and we open up a real estate um, trust, uh, do we need clear, Clean and Clear certificates for the money that we're paying? Or how, how, does, how do we actually pay for the house? from either the mother load trust or the real estate trust. I guess that's my, my confusion at the moment. The mother load trust can create and fund a new real estate trust. Right. right? So then a real estate trust will own the property outright. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm scanning my brain here to say this properly. So the money that's in your mother load trust has clean and clear certificates. The money you put into the real estate trust or the management trust to fund the property should also get clean and clear certificates from that bank. So first time you go around, you're getting a clean and clear from your exchange. Second, any transfers secondarily, are, well, number one, if they're within the same bank, it's not a big deal. But if right. you're going to go use it, different bank, then you probably will need a clean and clear from the bank that is holding the mother load trust. Okay. Okay, that and, makes okay. sense. Okay, also, you're going to, and you can only get the clean and clear at the time of deposit. You can't go, go back three days later, so I want a clean and clear. You can only get it at the time of deposit because the, the institute where you're depositing is already declared that it is clean and clear. Okay. It's, no, the, the institute where you're getting the money is already declared it is clean and clear. So you can't go back like a week later and say, oh, I want another one. I don't think it works that way. I may be wrong, but I don't think it works that way. I think you're right. All right, that, that answers that question. The, not, the other question I had regarding the management trust, when we set that up, if we do not put enough money in there initially to cover, because you know, it'll be paying our bills and for different trusts and whatever taxes, whatever we need, if we add more money to the management trust, is that money taxable then? In the current realm of the IRS, yes, it is. Who knows what's going to happen post Derby? Okay. Uh, would you have any recommendation as to how much money we should put in a management trust then? I am trying no to prepare for the future. Okay. Jim, what would you suggest? Jim? <clears throat> well, for me, I'm going to put in enough money to manage an automobile for five years. And I'm going to put in a little extra in case I decide I don't like that automobile and want to upgrade it. And um, that's really not that hard of a deal. You didn't change money. You just changed automobiles. And same with the real right. estate. I put enough money into the account uh, the, for my real estate to take care of my home for probably 10 years. So I'll have enough in there if I want to change things. Now, remember, you can always borrow more money and then you have the borrow trust. More. You can borrow, yes. Yeah, you can go to a lender and you can borrow some money and pay it off. You know, use the trust to pay, make the payments. So you can always upgrade that way. And, um, oh, yeah, one more thing I want to talk about. Remember, to make these, these contracts viable, back and forth, you have to have consideration. And if it's a loan, you have to have some type of an interest rate. 
Well, as far as I'm concerned, it's criminal to charge compound interest. So everything I always do is simple interest. So I, mm-hmm. I charge myself 2% simple interest on a $100,000 note. Well, that's you know, $2,000 in interest I have to pay over the term, not 20000 So when you buy right. a house right now for a 30-year mortgage, you pay three times the mortgage. Mm-hmm. If you, let's use a $100,000 house, so you have $300,000 by the time you pay the house off over 30 years. On simple interest, 10% interest you know, over term of years, you'll only pay $10,000 in interest, not 100000 not 300000 yeah. Big difference. So write your notes to be simple interest. Does that make sense? Yeah. M- makes Absolutely. sense. Yeah. Thank what you very, very much. You bet. You're welcome. One other thing that I um, we came across recently is a, how to be your own banker. And there's a couple books out there by Nelson Nash. You can get them on Amazon. And he talks about a method by which you buy an insurance policy and you borrow money from the insurance policy. And it goes back and forth. It's a little it's more than I want to explain over the phone because I haven't even read the book yet, but it makes a tremendous amount of sense, becoming your own banker using insurance policy. So you might, you know, Nelson Nash is on Amazon, so you might want to look that up. Yeah, well, years ago, there was, there was a, um, a um, course that I took that taught how to do that. and It wasn't that good of a course, so I didn't do a whole lot with it, but it was the same idea. You buy a specific type of insurance policy and as it slowly matures, but you can expedite the maturity by paying into it, you can borrow it all back. So it, it's a great way to go. It really is. Yeah. So we've got one more question, and we'll call it a day, okay? All right. Okay. Well, good afternoon, Luis. How are you today? Uh, very fine. Thank you, and, and, and good morning to Jim and, and you, Carl. Thank you. Hello. Uh, quick question. I, have, I was having problems on getting in the conference today. Um, uh, what is the proper way, and, I, and we have spoke about this, uh, Carol, in the past, but uh, I would like to take care of uh, this uh, topic uh, this time again. Um, what is the proper way to establish the status of your business trust uh, when the trustee is not uh, residing at the same place uh, as they, the, the trust may be? Um, well, I don't think that, that's an it issue, is, is it? Because, okay, I don't think that's an issue because, you know, um, I have a Nevada corporation, or used to anyway, and I live in Oregon, and that never became an issue. Um, as a trustee, you can conduct the business of the trust anywhere in the world. And um, so the bank shouldn't even question that. I mean, it's, it's kind of a, you know, just because you live in Oregon and your trusts are in the state of Washington, it's never been an issue. I mean, I have multiple accounts with Wells Fargo, and all of my trusts are harbored in a different state, every one of them. They're not harbored in, in Oregon. And as long as I live in Oregon, I have the right to receive and manage I have the right to receive the paperwork, the bills, the statements, and I have the right to sign on the checks, debit cards, so on and so forth, no matter where I'm at. It shouldn't be an issue. If it's an issue with your bank, we need to have a talk with them because um, that's just not right. Does that no, no, no. It's, no, no, the problem is not uh, for a bank creation or an account creation. It's just uh, uh, for, for to make sure that uh, the trust the business trust is in compliance with uh, with any questioning about that the site was, is uh, properly set up uh, uh, for that trust. Um, we never had an issue with with it, no matter what stage you put it in. I'm not sure I ans- I understand the question. Of course, your your um, uh, your 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 a call is real fuzzy to me. I mean, it's hard for me to to hear him. Yeah, I agree. Step, I mean. Move the phone a little bit away from your mouth. It might be clearer. Okay. Uh, let me specific. For for example, uh, if I cite my my trust on Florida, uh, uh, because I created my EIN uh, with the uh, Florida uh, state 
uh, residing in Florida State, then the Florida regulations, I know it's statutory, but the, the rule of thumb of Florida is that uh, the site of a trust is where the uh, trustee resides. So just to know if uh, there is a state where that rule may be more flexible. Well, let's well, do some research on that, I think. Yeah, we, let us, yeah, we'll get back with you on that. Um, Carol, do you have a way to get a hold of him? You got his number? Yeah, I've got it, yeah. Okay, let's do some research on that. I'm not running across that issue with uh, any of the trusts I'm doing and have. Um, th there's never been a question with uh, Wells Fargo that the fact that the trusts are in Washington and I'm in Oregon. They open the account. They don't ask questions. It's never been an issue. In fact, I have cars that are licensed in Oregon in a trust that's harbored in Washington. And just for your knowledge, just to blow my own whistle tad here, I'm the guy that they – I went in and got my car, a newer car, uh, put into a trust. It was an existing trust. I took the old car out, put a new car in. And, the, and the, the young man that was working with me, he looks at that, he pulls it up, he goes, oh, I know who you are. I thought, uh-oh, now I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> when a state boy says something like that, you know you're in trouble. No. What he says, we use your trust in our training. You have this trust. It's called MBZ Trust. It stands for Mercedes-Benz. And I had a Mercedes-Benz, an older classic, years ago in 1991, as a matter of fact, yeah, when I set that up. you had when we met. Yeah, and I still got it. And right now it's got a funky old uh, Ford in it, but it's so hot, you know. And as he said, we've used your trust over the years, all the cars you've taken in and out, to train our employees. And I just went through the training. It's good to meet you. I thought, okay. There you go. <laughs> so, but, you know, Jim, I think you're misunderstanding Luis's question. Uh, Luis, um, I think what you're trying to say is, does, as far as the state is concerned, where your trust is domiciled, does it need a resident trustee? Is that correct? Correct. No, okay. it does not. It all depends on the state. I think Luis did some, in, did some investigation into Florida. So we'll have to check it out, Luis, and okay. we'll do some research and get back to you, okay? Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, Jim, I think that's about it today. We've got about 17 minutes over, so you want to um, want to close? Sure. Um, this probably will be my last call for a while with everybody. We're, we're going to have another one on the 28th. I'll be traveling or won't be available, so I may not be on that one. Uh, have a great holiday. Um, the rumors about me having some issues are true, so I may not be available for a while. So um, with that said, I'm just going to sign off and say that have a great Christmas. All right. Thank you. But we do have one more question here from Connie. How are you, Connie? Hi there. It's Connie in sunny Florida. And I send you all Merry Christmas wishes and a safe, prosperous, healthy, better 2020 and that all this goes smoothly. Um, and I know, Jim, you know, you'd been sick, so I didn't get the email back. But I need to know, what is the website on that credit card or debit card that you were talking about for, um, you know, and you said Wells Fargo just a little bit ago was oh, actually the bank. TransferWise, Transfer, T-R-A-N-S-W-I-S-E, TransferWise.com. Okay. TransferWise. Dot com. All one word except the dot com, right, Jim? Correct. Cool. Awesome. Great call. Love you all bunches, and just trust the best for everybody's good health. All right. Thank you, Connie. Thank you. You, you too, dear. Bye. Bye-bye. Uh, well, thank you all for your time and attention today. And, again, I, I, we love it when you participate with your questions. It really makes a big difference to us. Um. I would like to encourage you all to read or reread my big, fat, wonderfully wealthy life. Jim has put it on the website or will be on the website later today. Uh, it's just got a lot of information on there. Some of it I found a little bit more than I needed, but you know, skip over those parts. So you can reach me at 877-333-5018, Monday through Friday. I accept calls from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Central Time Zone, so please be aware of the time zone differences. 
Also, if you're going to call Jim, he's on the West Coast. So please be aware of time, time zones. We will be taking off. I forgot to tell you this, Jim. We will be taking off for Christmas week. So our next regular call will be January 11th, 2020, unless, of course, we have an RV. Good luck. Merry Christmas to all. And um, let's keep those fingers and toes crossed. This is going to happen soon. Go RV. Bye-bye. Thank you.